Well, good morning, Walden Church. I remember uh, when I was growing up, I went on a lot of camping trips with my mom and dad, and this was back when park rangers would actually come by and talk to you. They would check in on you. They would look at your campsite, they would say hi to the kids, and on one particular trip, a park ranger gave my brother and I a book, and this is it. It's the true story of Smokey Bear. And even today, I can still remember all of the pictures that were in this book because Smokey became one of my childhood favorite stories. If you don't know, in the spring of 1950, in the Captain Mountains of New Mexico, a young bear cub found himself caught in a burning forest. He took refuge in a tree, and while managing to stay alive was left badly burned. The firefighters who retrieved him were so moved by his bravery, they named him Smokey. The news about Smokey Bear uh, traveled all across the nation, and he was soon given a new home at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And the living symbol of Smokey Bear played an important role in spreading messages of wildfire prevention and forest conservation. And we all know Smokey's famous catchphrase, only you can prevent forest fires. Listen to our passage today from the book of James. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about how we should communicate with one another. But whereas most of us, we've probably never memorized this passage. We've never memorized James 3, but we have all memorized our mother's famous words. And that was, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. It's funny, really, because every single one of us knows those motherly words of wisdom, and yet so few of us live by it. Ephesians 4 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, this might be the biggest change for many of us during this series on how we can live our best lives. Because our culture has adopted this unethical standard that it's okay to cut people down, that it's okay to talk back, talk down, backstab, gossip, especially if they're not in the room. And it's gotten worse with the adage of the internet. According to one survey, cell phone owners aged 18 to 24 send 2,000 and 22 text messages a month on average. That's 67 texts on a daily basis. And they receive another 1,800 or so. That's a lot of words that get exchanged. But sadly today, people think the internet is a place where they can do things without consequence. Because you can't catch what you can't see. The stranger you walk past on the street could be anyone. Could be good, could be bad. If you saw that person do something in real life and you disagreed with it, then you could take action. You could retaliate because you know, you said, this is the person that did it. I witnessed it. But on the internet, we all have screen names. We have avatars. And some of us might not even have a picture at all. And it's because of this anonymity that we've adopted this attitude that we can blend into the rest of the cyber universe. That's why internet trolls do what they do. There's no repercussions for the person who says it because they don't have to face the other person. It's the cheater way of being rude. And they get away with it. And we learn this from TV. We do. We learn this from movies. Or we even learn it from stand-up comics. It's funny to make fun of someone. There's always one person who ends up being the comedy relief in any show. Someone that we can all point the finger at, laugh at, and make fun of. But the reason we have this 
wisdom, right, is because we know that words are powerful things. And so we should only be saying nice words, right? Our words should be kind, edifying. Our words should build other people up. Proverbs 22 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 18 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. See, the wisdom of the Proverbs say that there is fruit in our words. In other words, life, right? Healing in our words. But the opposite side of that is they also contain death. When Paul writes in Ephesians, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Paul writes these words. He uses this phrase corrupting talk or unwholesome talk. It's the Greek word sapros. Sapros means it's rotting. Sapros means it's decaying. In other words, let no forest fire, no destruction, no burning, no death come out of your lips. So every time we communicate, every time we open our mouth, or yeah, anytime we post something critical on the internet, we are making a choice in how we communicate. We are communicating either with life or with death. It's very easy to pattern the way we talk by the standards of the world. And we want to talk like everybody else. We want to say the same things that everybody else says. Or, you know, maybe, maybe you're not even being mean. You're just like, I'm not being mean. But because you understand how powerful words are, they can also manipulate, right? We can use words to manipulate. We can manipulate somebody's actions, manipulate somebody's feelings. We can use the words we say to get the results that we want rather than being Christians who use our words to get the things that God wants. For example, um, we could get angry, right? Sure, we could get angry, and then we could retaliate with angry words. We could strike back. We could feel hurt, and then we strike back with hurtful words. Proverbs 15 says a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Matthew 12 says, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The book of Psalms says, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. And I think especially with anger, we see this more commonly with men in today's world. If there's a man in your life who you care about and who is prone to anger and irritability, that can be a very difficult thing to live with. Anger can be a difficult emotion to feel sympathy towards, especially if you find yourself on the receiving end of it. You know, psychologists today, they say that anger is actually a secondary emotion to much more deeper and painful feelings. Men often express anger and irritability as a way of coping with depression, especially if they feel stress from home. A lot of men struggle with persistent and strong feelings of anger because it's too emasculating to show the emotion that really is lying underneath that. You know, there's an old a church story about a preacher who felt the calling to step down from the pulpit and to make room for a new younger preacher. And at his farewell dinner, he tried to encourage everyone, uh, and especially the founding members of the church, who, who looked so sad. And there was one particular member who was actually crying. And so the pastor felt sympathy. He went over and he says, hey, don't be sad. Uh, you know, the next, the next preacher might even be better than me. And the sad church member shook her head and said, no, I don't believe it, because that's what everybody said when you came. <laughs> on June 18th, 1956, a freak accident happened on the lake in New York. 
a speeding motorboat, bounced on a wave, and shot out two passengers, a 50-year-old man and a little girl. And to keep her from drowning, the man held her head above the water while the boat circled back. They rescued the girl, but the man sank and drowned. That's how Dawson Trotman died. He was the founding member of the Navigators, which is an international discipleship ministry. According to a quote in Time Magazine, he lived to save others. His death was just the way he would have planned it. And at his funeral, Billy Graham said that he died just the way he lived, always lifting someone up. What a legacy to be known as someone who lifted others up, someone who was always encouraging others. It has taken me all my life to learn that even one good word from me, some encouragement from me can literally inspire, literally help people. You know, there was a study done using children and the effects that encouragement had on them. You had a whole team of psychologists hooking up wires and sensors to children, and they would either use encouraging words and gestures or discouraging words and gestures. And what the study showed was when the children were encouraged, their physical energy would increase. But when they were discouraged, their energy level would drop drastically. But you don't need to be a psychologist in a research group to know that. We all need encouragement. We all like to receive encouragement, don't we? And when we receive encouragement, we feel that other people care about us. We should be encouraged then to encourage. My prayer is that through this message, God is going to inspire you to shift from burning to building, from tearing down to lifting up, from hurtful words to helpful words. And we read some passages already out of the book of James. I want to read a couple more. And in our first point, we understand that our tongue is small, but it has a huge impact, right? Our tongue is small, but it has a huge impact. That's a very simple way of saying the power of our words is disproportionate to the comparative size of our tongue. James chapter 3 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. You know, back then in the Greco-Roman world, they actually did have very large sea vessels. They did. Paul records being aboard a boat, a grain ship, that carried 276 passengers plus cargo. The Jewish historian Josephus, he records that he was on a ship with 600 passengers. He describes its dimensions as being 180 feet long by 65 feet wide. James says, your tongue is small, but it's something that steers a large vessel. In other words, our words have power. The meanings of our words crystallize perceptions, shape our beliefs, drive our behavior, and ultimately create our world. That's why we talk about the power of the press. That's why we say things like, the pen is mightier than the sword. The power of words arises from our emotional responses when we speak, read, or even hear them. I mean, just shout out the word fire while barbecuing or in the workplace or in a crowded movie theater, you're going to get three completely different emotional and energetic responses. Japanese scientist Masuro Emoto performed some really fascinating experiments on the effects that words have, their energy. And he did this way back in the 1990s. Emoto poured pure clean water into vials, 
and he labeled them with phrases like, I hate you, and he encouraged other scientists to say hurtful things to the water. After 24 hours, the water was frozen, but it didn't crystallize under the microscope. In fact, it yielded gray, misshapen clumps instead of the beautiful lace-like crystals. In contrast, Emoto placed labels on dirty water that said things like, I love you and peace. And after 24 hours, they produced gleaming, perfectly hexagonal crystals. So Emoto's experiments proved that the energy generated by positive or negative words can actually change the physical structure of an object. Advice, toss out the old saying, sticks and stones. That was never true. Words really can hurt you. If you're tempted to minimize the impact of your words and the effect that they have on other people, don't. Consider the consequences. Have you even mildly hurt someone's feelings or ignited a firestorm? The Bible says words have a huge impact. So realistically evaluate the damage that you might have done and then give that person some time and some space. Hurtful words elicit an emotional reaction. So sometimes it's best to let those intense feelings cool a bit before attempting to you know, reassure them, but don't give them too much time and space Waiting too long to address the issue will only complicate matters even more. So as soon as you sense that the time is right to discuss your mistake, please do it. And remember that it's not because they are too sensitive. It's not because they can't take a joke. They're, that's just shifting the blame from you onto the other person. They are not upset because they are too sensitive, but more so because our words often reveal what's really in our heart. Our words often reveal what's really on our heart. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's hard. When someone says something hurtful and then quickly apologizes, the apology doesn't feel real. And perhaps they say, I don't know why I said that. I don't, I don't even mean it. Jesus says, bad trees grow bad fruit. Advice, let's skip the excuses. Let's skip the rationalizations. You're only gonna dig yourself deeper into a hole by saying things like, I was just kidding. Or you know what, you know, I was stressed out and you know, I, I just wasn't thinking clearly. Take responsibility. If you've blown it, the best way to recover is by admitting the error of your way. Be a stand-up person. Be accountable for your actions. And then offer a sincere apology. Not a quick apology. Few people reject a heartfelt apology. But if they detect even a little bit of insincerity, your words will, will fall flat. And in that apology, make sure you say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Many people find those two words very hard to say, but a true apology is going to need them. And then let's practice moving from burning to building. Proverbs 17 says a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Proverbs 12 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, the authors of the book, The Simple Truths of Service, did some training with 3,000 grocery store employees and retail outlets across the country. And they talked about the power of words and how what you say really does make a difference in people's lives. And the author said that about a month after the training went by, they got a phone call from a manager at a grocery store who said, I, I just can't believe it. Something really amazing has started to happen. I was walking around the store and I noticed while we had lots of checkers at uh, every checkout lane, one particular checkout lane where Ethan was doing bagging, 
that line went all the way back to the frozen food section. He said, I would tell people over the intercom and I would announce that other lines were open. We would walk up and down the long line and tell them they could go to other lines and people would just look at us and say, no, we're gonna wait because we wanna hear Ethan's encouraging word for the day. One woman came by and grabbed the supervisor and she said, I only come to the grocery store to receive Ethan's encouraging words. She said, I used to come once a week and she goes, now I come almost every day. Ethan, of course, was at that training. Ethan later told the authors of, his, of the book, he said, I'm 19 years old I, and I have Down syndrome. I work as a bagger in a grocery store, he said, and I went back to the store after the conference and I just didn't know how to apply your statements. He said, I liked the talk, but I just didn't know what to do with it. So he said, I went home, talked to my dad, and we came up with this idea. My dad and I sat down at the computer every day and we wrote up a, a statement that was, in, that was affirming or something that was encouraging. We'd type up about six different quotes on a computer. We'd print them out and then we'd cut them out. And Ethan would have about 300 of these different quotes on little pieces of paper. And then every night, Ethan would sign every single one of them by hand. Then the next day at the grocery store, he would put his stack of quotes by the bags where he put the groceries and he would bag up everyone's groceries and in the last sack he would put that encouraging word for the day and he would look at that person and he would say i put something very special in this sack for you i hope it will brighten your day and ethan does this every single day that he works the store manager said that it changed the entire culture of the store even in the floral department, if a flower was broken, they would often just throw it away. Now they walk out into the line on their own initiative and they will pin it to an elderly woman or a young girl just to brighten their day. There's a lot of people at that grocery store, but the most important person is Ethan, the beggar, because he's speaking words of life. He's speaking words that are literally changing the culture and if it can happen at a grocery store, right, it can happen anywhere. So here's some advice on being encouraging. Number one, smile, <laughs> smile. I could, I could take this advice myself. You know, sometimes a very well-timed smile is all that you need just to give somebody a little bit of encouragement. And best of all, it doesn't require any words, right? If you lock eyes with someone, Instead of looking away quickly in embarrassment, smile. Number two, listen. Another thing we can do without words, listening to someone is one of the most important things we can do. Rather than rushing in and just trying to fix something, if you actually become sympathetic, be an ear, you can start to quickly build a reputation that you are an encourager. Three, sympathize. Once we understand what the issue is, an important part of encouraging someone is validating their feelings, trying to understand why they feel that way. I personally find that one of the least effective ways to encourage someone is to say things like, it'll be fine. Don't worry, you'll be great. Rather, it's really important to let the person know that you recognize their feelings as legitimate and use words like, I understand, or that must be difficult. If you're a parent or a teacher or you're a supervisor, catch someone doing something right and then let them know that you noticed. This is one of those tips that always comes up in management courses and in parenting books because it's very effective. It shows the other person that you notice them making an effort and because you pointed it out, now they're more likely to repeat that action. So it's a win-win for everyone. Five, share positive thoughts as soon as they occur to you. Now this probably isn't always possible, but if you can, it's always better to mention it right away. When you notice somebody putting in the effort, don't wait till later because then you run the risk of forgetting. Like lots of things, I think 
actively encouraging people is probably one of those habits which will become easier as we practice it, which hopefully will lead to you praise and effort and progress no matter how small. Praise, effort, and progress no matter how small. It's the best way to encourage someone to keep trying. Having said that, it's also definitely good to make a point of praising people who go the extra mile, too. The bottom line is that you get more out of what you draw attention to, which means it's a great idea to encourage steps of any size as long as they are in the right direction. This is a really powerful tool because not only do they get all the receiving end of your encouragement, but there's a chance that other people who notice what you're doing, they will also do it, they'll join in. Seven, Christians should say thank you, right? Christians should say thank you. If anyone should be known as being an encourager, it should be a Christian. Being an encourager is actually a form of evangelism. So write a letter of appreciation to someone at work. Write a letter of appreciation to your apartment manager, your child's, your child's teacher, or your doctor. Often when we interact with these people, you know, we are asking for them to serve us in some way. So we should take time to say thank you. Eight, learn someone's love language. What is that? Well, it's the special way that we communicate and understand love. In his book, The Five Love Languages, Gary Chapman explains that not everyone's emotional needs are met in the exact same way. And that's an important thing to learn as we try to figure out what other people need. The five love languages are words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Number nine, show up. I just wanna say this again. Number nine is show up. What does that mean? Well, it means if you're part of a church, Bible study, a fellowship, show up. If you don't show up every single day to work, you're basically telling your boss, I don't care. Or, you know, I only come to work when I feel like it. Believe it or not, but your presence encourages others. It encourages me. When you show up, I'm encouraged. I feel the energy and the strength of the room. I feel that what we're doing here matters. When you show up, you are telling others that you are a part of this community and you are telling others that they are not alone. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Number 10, notice when people encourage you. If we make a point of noticing when someone else has behaved in an encouraging way toward us, then it lets them know that we appreciate that. Not only that, but we might also learn something from the process because we're on the receiving end of it. The world doesn't need any more critics. Right? We get enough of that on TV, social media, the news, the water cooler. The world doesn't need any more critics. Rather, what the world needs is for people like you and me to come alive by steering clear of those discouragers of the world and that we join the encouragers. There is a great call for more people to be thoughtful of their words and actions in interactions with others. Let's answer that call and let's encourage and not discourage. Let's build and not burn. Today I wanna to close with a 12th century prayer from Francis of Assisi. Let's pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, let us show light. And where there is sadness, let us show joy. 
Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you so much for watching and being here with us this morning. We're so glad to have you. Of course, we also want to remind you that we are here, we are open, we are receptive. We would love to have you here in our services. We have two services every Sunday, one at 930, which is our traditional service, and we have a choir, we sing uh, standards, we sing hymns, and then we have a service at 11 o'clock with a worship team. We sing more contemporary songs. Uh, the dress is casual, come in your jeans, come however you like. We also have our children's program at that time and youth group. We also have youth group during the week. So every single Wednesday at six o'clock, we have a youth group that meets in the rear building. Uh, you can send your kids over on their skateboard or their bike, or they can walk over. We'll even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We love you guys. We wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you next time. Bye.